On May 18, 1980, a geologic event occurred that not only shocked the world because of its explosive power, but it challenged the way we think about the Earth at its very foundation. That event was the eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in the United States of America, what, 41 years ago, before and then after. The mountain was radically changed by the geologic event that day, and we might call it, I'll call it the Rosetta Stone of Catastrophist Geology. You know what the Rosetta Stone is? It's that uh, trilingual uh, rock with the three languages that was found in Egypt. And that Rosetta Stone was the um, understanding or re-understanding of the ancient Egyptian language, hieroglyphics. And it was an extinct language that was rediscovered. That's what happened at Mount St. Helens. We discovered or rediscovered an extinct language. Mount St. Helens is used uh, as a Rosetta Stone to, uh, in the context of the essential clue to a new field of knowledge. There's the pro old profile of the volcano. It was... Uh, 2,945 meters high. After the eruption, it lost the 400 meters of elevation during the explosion and volcanic eruption. And now it's 2,550 meters high in elevation. And it radically changed the landscape around the volcano. Mount St. Helens Rosetta Stone of Catastrophist Geology and gives us a perspective that helps us understand the global flood in Earth history. There's a volcano in full eruption, and uh, we have that verse, Psalm 1, pardon me, Psalm 46, verse 8. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth who has made desolations in the earth. I take that verse literally, and what does that say to me as a geologist? Get your boots on and go out there and see what that volcano did, okay? And that's what I've been doing for, uh, for 41 years now, has been going to the volcano. In fact, I uh, was there before the eruption, and uh, it's great to go back and see what the things have done. I was last back there in August. There's the old profile of the volcano, 2,945 meters high. There's a new profile, 2,550 meters high. It lost 400 meters of uh, elevation. One half cubic mile, or what does that work out to? About four cubic kilometers of rock on the summit of the volcano slid away in a gigantic landslide a quarter of the landslide material, about a cubic kilom uh, about three cubic kilometers, went into Spirit Lake Basin, that lake basin on the left side, and uh, it displaced the water of that lake in a giant water wave up to 860 feet high, huge water wave, and uh, it uh, uh, changed the whole landscape around the lake, and then a quarter of the landslide material, about a, uh, a cubic kilometer, um, um, went down to the west and over the ridge in the foreground. You can see that. Here's the uh, old profile before the e explosion, a summit eruption in May, uh, in April, and in going back to March, 1980, the summit eruption. This is the last photograph that was taken about five minutes before the volcano exploded. And I'll, I'll show you that a little bit more. And you can see a sequence of photos showing the morph 
image of that volcano five minutes before and then the 50 seconds as the volcano collapsed. These photographs were taken from the northeast side of the volcano. Earthquake, directly under the mountain, magnitude 5.1 earthquake, the whole mountain shook and the rocks started sliding on the north slope. Three rotational slides of rock, about four cubic kilometers of rock was in slide, and as it slid off the summit of the volcano, the pressure inside the volcano that was being held down by that rock mass caused the explosion to occur. And that explosion was uh, very significant, equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT blast energy. Here's the um, simulation of the first uh, 50 seconds. Okay, let's go at this. Well, you'll see the, the rotational mass as it slides. The, the uh, large rock slides uh, is in operation. The base of the slope uh, has slid away. The middle part is sliding, and the upper uh, crater area is getting ready to slide. That is the earthquake. The earthquake caused the rock slide, the rock slide became an avalanche of mixed rock fragments, and then all of the rock as it moved off the summit, the four cubic kilometers or so, moved off the summit. Then the uh, pressure was released in the volcano and it flashed to steam, and a steam explosion occurred. Now the, the, the north slope of the volcano had given way, and so what happened was the north side of the volcano was not there, so the blast did not go vertical. The steam explosion occurred horizontally. And one of the most unusual aspects of the eruption of Mount St. Helens is the horizontal blast over the landscape. And uh, that was equivalent to 375 square kilometer area where the steam blast went over the landscape, devastating the forest that was in that area. And so it was uh, a significant uh, blast. It took about six to 10 minutes for the steam blast to completely level the forest over the 375 uh, square kilometer area <laughs> and uh, in just in a matter of minutes. And uh, this uh, is the beginning of the rock slide. Let's take earthquake, rock slide. Now you can see the rocks on the north side of the volcano the, on the right there are dropping into that lake basin on the other side of that ridge. And as they drop in, the middle part of the landslide is moving. And then you can see a puff of steam at the summit and a puff of steam in the middle. And as the rock slide moves away, it uh, allows the steam to jet from the volcano uh, opening northward over the landscape. And you can see rocks being thrown out ballistically by the force of the blast horizontally. Some of those rocks are visible from 10 miles away in these photographs, 10 miles distance. So what are the size of those rock fragments? They're a size of, the, uh, of, of buildings, of city blocks, that kind of thing. So this uh, steam explosion was uh, significant. Uh, equivalent to 20 million tons of TNT blast energy. And uh, so this is the, uh, at 8.32 in the morning, at 17 seconds after 8.32, there was a Richter magnitude 5 earthquake, and the whole mountain started to collapse, and, an, and the collapse caused the steam explosion over the rock slide avalanche. And that's 50 seconds. You can see the, the big rock fragments being thrown out uh, in ballistic trajectory by the, by the blast. This 50 seconds or so of the eruption um, created the transformation of the landscape. You see the old profile of the volcano there in Washington State 
in uh, northwestern United States. You see the, the, the very symmetrical profile. And if you look at the screen, you can see, oops, excuse me, what happened there? Okay. Yeah. You see rocks being thrown out ballistically. Then you see the profile. Now notice this uh, area right there on the right and notice that area on the left. I'll show it to you after the eruption from exactly the same location. Okay, from exactly the same location after the eruption. Notice the enormous transformation of the summit area of the volcano. <laughs> and uh, notice the foreground right here. It's higher. It's about, uh, let's see, 200 meters higher. And there's an area of about 60 square kilometers on the western and northern side of the volcano that is uh, Earth's newest landscape. That was sky before the eruption in the foreground. Now it is a land surface. Before, okay, and here the next one is after. And then appreciate the foreground. You can see the lower terrain, okay, before, and then there's the uh, new landscape after. So uh, this uh, allows the whole thing to be illustrated or animated, and it was done by some video producers, uh, and uh, done fairly well. And so I can show you the simulation of the first 50 seconds. How's that? Okay, you want to see what, what the 50 seconds was like? Well done, geologically uh, accurate uh, explosion. Okay, and I'll g give my overview as the sound comes on. You should be able to hear the sound. Here, here it comes. Simulation, the first 50 seconds. Earthquake, magnitude 5.1. Rock slide. Rocks are falling from the summit and then sliding in mass. They disperse and form a rock avalanche. The rock avalanche is moving away from the summit northward. As it moves away from the summit, of course, the pressure is released inside the volcano and it flashes to steam. And then the steam blast is supersonic and it's moving much faster than the rock avalanche and so away from the volcano it overtops the rock avalanche debris and knocks down the forest uh what uh 375 square kilometers of forest in six to ten minutes okay that's the uh, that's the event if you if you want and uh it happened in uh uh, in 1980 at 8.32 in the morning. There's the profile after the eruption. You can see Spirit Lake there on the left side, the, the Spirit Lake Basin, and uh, you see the change summit elevation. You can see the ridge was overtopped by the uh, avalanche debris in one place, and of course the, the, the area north of the volcano was leveled. 57 people died as a result of the direct uh, explosion of the volcano. All were warned were in areas they were advised of significant danger. And uh, so it was uh, severe. The main eruption, May 18 to October 18, uh, 1980. The main eruption, of course, uh, May 18th, 1980. It was a nine-hour eruption that day on May 18th. For nine hours, it erupted violently. And that day, on May 18th, 1980, 
it released the energy equivalent of 400 million tons of TNT blast energy. 400 million tons of TNT is equivalent to 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Okay, and that's just a small volcano from the standpoint of human experience and history. Nine-hour eruption, 20,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Um, uh, and tw uh, 20,000 uh, minutes, okay, it's an atomic bomb a minute, something like that, you know. That, that's, uh, well, a second, atomic bomb a second for the nine-hour eruption, 20,000 seconds in nine hours. So atomic bomb a second, that's the power output of the volcano in full eruption, yet that is just a small to average volcano from the standpoint of human experience in history. There have been a lot bigger volcanic eruptions, like the explosion at Yellowstone in, in uh, north uh, western United States at Yellowstone in Wyoming. There was an enormous uh, explosion. See the uh, elliptical depression in the collapse structure looking south over Yellowstone? As you see that elliptical uh, depression, it's something like 50 kilometers long. That's a gigantic collapsed volcano. Yellowstone, when it exploded, it had so much energy that it eviscerated the inside of the volcano into the atmosphere. The whole volcano collapsed into the ground to make the Yellowstone caldera. Okay, Yellowstone's famous for what? Hot springs and geysers and, and all kinds of, uh, of, of interesting uh, landforms. And uh, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River. And of course, there's the, the Teton Mountains to the south. And so it's a famous place. The energy that made that explosion had more than 2,000 times the energy of Mount St. Helens. That's a big volcano, Yellowstone explosion. Yet there's no, uh, no recorded history of a volcanic explosion like Yellowstone. More energy than all the nuclear weapons in the world is simultaneously detonated over Yellowstone. That's a big volcanic e explosion structure, Yellowstone. Big eruptions in the past. And so you can see something of a portal through Mount St. Helens into the explosion power of those ancient volcanoes. On six major rivers downstream from Mount St. Helens, there was very significant uh, mud flows. Melted snow on the summit of the volcano from the intense heat caused the, the melted water to flow abruptly into the drainages, the rivers, and downstream from the volcano up to, what, um, 75 kilometers from the volcano, people's homes and property were overcome by the mud. And dozens of bridges were washed away by the, the force of the mud. The volcano mud flows was the most severe dollar damage or monetary damage from the explosion. Not the steam blast, but the mud. And the mud uh, killed people and, and damaged property way far downstream from the volcano. And that reminds us of, uh, you know, how severe volcanic uh, eruptions can be because they can cause other things like rivers of moving mud. Here's um, an image of the mud flows going down uh, the Cowlitz River area, the Toodle River and the Cowlitz River off to the west of the volcano. The mud moved pretty fast on the slopes of the volcano, in some places maybe a freeway speed, uh, Audubon uh, speed, okay, you can see it moving, and uh, away from the volcano in the lower uh, drainages, it, it uh, 
washed away all kinds of things and severe mud flow damage away from the volcano. Dozens of bridges. Uh, all kinds of uh, farmland was overcome. Uh, logging camps were overcome. Very severe. Okay, let's talk about some of the things a volcano did very rapidly. And this is some of the uh, Rosetta Stone kind of discoveries at Mount St. Helens. Okay, at Mount St. Helens, there's a uh, north and west of the volcano, there was 60 square kilometer area, 60 square kilometer area, with up to 200 meters of deposit. And it's Earth's newest landscape. And as you go out there, that was sky before the eruption. That is now the surface of, a, of the new earth. And it's one of the, because there's been volcanoes since Mount St. Helens, it's not the newest landscape on earth, but it's the newest large landscape that was, has been formed on earth. And uh, yes, a 60 square kilometer area up to 200 meters thick. Now, we have photographs of the volcanic eruption sequence during the nine-hour eruption on May 18 and the eruption that occurred for about five months after May 18th through August of uh, 1980, and that allows us to piece together the sequence of the deposits at the volcano, and that is probably one of the most interesting things is that all of the pieces of the landslide and the mud flow and uh, what are called pyroclastic flows, everything in Mount St. Helens has a date. And you can, uh, because we have photographs, it's most intensely studied volcanic eruption in history. We have all of these photographs of the, of the area there. Uh, it can be pieced together, the sequence of the 200 meters of deposits north of the volcano. There were events called pyroclastic flow. Pyroclastic flow. Pyro meaning hot or fire. Clastic mean broken and flow. And so the, uh, the, there were kind of burps during the eruption sequence and uh, the venting of this uh, steam blasted rock into uh, clouds of debris that were ground-hugging flows over the surface. And these pyroclastic flows came out of the volcano moving uh, twice Audubon speed, you know, uh, uh, really fast, 300 kilometers per hour or something like that. And uh, when the flows froze, they form these kind of long tongue-like uh, objects that you see over the landscape. See the, the, the tongue-like flows over the surface of the landscape. Those, those are pyroclastic flow deposits. Pyroclastic flow deposits. And those of us who are geologists that were wandering around at, at the volcano afterwards we, uh, we loved looking at these things, and uh, boy, were they interesting. And uh, you can see where the pyroclastic flow deposits have been eroded away, and we can see the strata which have formed in the uh, early uh, uh, f formation of, the, of that landscape the 60 square kilometer area landscape. Each layer at Mount St. Helens has a date, how's that? And uh, here you see uh, my field assistant for scale, and you can see the broken fragmental debris from the May 18, 1980 eruption, the last four, uh, four or five hours of the airfall debris on the afternoon of May 18th. At the end of the, whoop, end of the nine hour eruption, let me go back to that. At the end of the nine hour eruption, right here, that's the airfall debris. 
the technical term is airfall tephra. Airfall tephra. Then on top of that sits the pyroclastic flow deposit from June 12, 1980. Now, on June 12, 1980, between about 9 p.m. and midnight on June 12, 1980, the radar imagery of the summit of Mount St. Helens from Portland, Oregon, showed an immense mass of volcanic debris over the summit. And as that uh, was there, the pyroclastic flows formed, and they had to form in less than three hours. And so between 9 p.m. and midnight on uh, June 12, 1980, this 25-foot thickness, 25 feet is what? Uh, <laughs> well, maybe eight meters or nine meters of deposits formed. And what is interesting is the stratification running through that. I'll talk, I'll talk more in detail about that in a minute. Okay, but the pyroclastic flow deposit of uh, June 12th, 1980 is extremely interesting to somebody like me. And then on top of that sits the mud flow deposit from March 19th, 1982. Okay, on March 19th, 1982, there was a summit eruption in that crater that formed and that melted snow and it created another mud flow and moving at free freeway speed, it deposited that. Another uh, eight meters or so in thickness, the mud flow deposit, March 19th, 1982. And so every layer has a date, and that, that's what's cool. And as you look at what's formed by the catastrophic event, it causes me to wonder. Like, look at, there's the top of the June 12th deposit, the upper half of it, and the closer you get to it, the more layered it becomes. Notice how layered it is? Uh, layers are uh, very obvious. Now, I had thought that a catastrophe, a catastrophic explosion and flow, uh, a pyroclastic flow, would make a homogenized deposit. You know, the fine material would be mixed with the coarse and that it wouldn't stratify out like uh, we see here. And I had thought that slow and gradual process causes layers to form with fine and coarse debris following one another. And so you can see the pyroclastic flow deposit of June 12, 1980 provides evidence of rapid strata formation, extremely rapid strata formation. That formed in a hurricane, okay? That's the kind of thing that you, uh, you think about. An even closer look, uh, hand for scale, you can see micro-thin lamination of all things formed in a hurricane. And so Mount St. Helens provides a living modern laboratory for the study of catastrophic uh, sedimentation. Micro-thin stratification formed rapidly. Now I'd seen this kind of stratification like on the bank of a river have you seen that, you know, digging uh, some on the sand on a beach? You can imagine how a uh, slow process, like between summer and winter, between wet years and dry years, that, that, that would form stratification. But no, stratification like this, uh, the coarse and the fine sediment can form rapidly. That's what Mount St. Helens shows. Now, it provided a laboratory model for the study of other stratification. Like where? Grand Canyon, for example. There's a sandstone layer 4,000 feet below the rim of the Grand Canyon. And what do you see in it? You see layers and, and uh, uh, the, uh, that same stratification process. Many of the same layering characteristics that we see in the pyroclastic flow deposits of Mount St. Helens 
are seen in some of the sandstone layers. The sandstone layers in Grand Canyon, we think, form by water, not by pyroclastic flow, but by slurries moving through gas or slurries moving through water, that's the same process, essentially. And so uh, we can understand flood form strata and appreciate flood form strata at Mount St. Helens. Interesting, isn't it? So stratification at Mount St. Helens provides a window to understand stratification elsewhere in the earth, like in those sandstone strata in uh, Grand Canyon. Okay, not, not only uh, did we have rapidly formed stratification at the volcano, but we had rapid erosion. And uh, here is where mud flows came out of the volcano on the north side of the volcano, and you can see the uh, ancient lava flow, which has been dissected or gouged out by the mud that came down through there, and you see the modern stream flowing through the canyon. There's a modern little, little waterfall and a stream coming through this canyon. That canyon's about 100 feet deep, and that was eroded by mud after the summer of 1980. After the summer of 1980, that canyon appeared, and uh, it's a 100-foot deep canyon. Elsewhere, we found a canyon up to 600 feet deep. 600 feet deep, uh, what? Uh, 200 meters deep, you know, something like that. Uh, that's a, a significant canyon. There's, uh, there's the canyon eroded through ancient volcanic ash deposit, ancient landslide debris deposit, ancient lava flow, hard rock was eroded by mud after the summer of 1980. So rapidly formed canyon right there at the volcano. March 19, 1982, there was a mud flow in the from the crater. There was a little lake behind the uh, lava dome that was breached and the melted snow inside the crater formed this river of mud that moved down to the north out of the, the crater and it modified that landscape, that uh, 375 square kilometer area by the mud flow. And the mud flow went through that area north of the volcano and it created a, an eroded landscape. And that's what we're looking at here. The mud came out of the volcano, came right through this area right here, and down this uh, new drainage basin that formed. And uh, it pooled behind a large depression right here. This large depression uh, was a, a big steam explosion pit. It filled with mud. The mud overtopped the western lip of that pit, and then it cataract down, made a waterfall. The waterfall eroded back up and made a canyon, and then that canyon uh, kept on draining and made this big canyon. Then later, another eruption caused the stream to reposition from that old channel to the new channel. As we looked at this terrain, uh, north of the volcano, we saw where the mud had, had come through and a series of five different drainages come together and there's this gigantic breach, breached area right here. And this is where the mud pooled behind the high elevation. There was spillover and that spillover caused the dam to be eroded and as the dam eroded, the whole basin was modified by the, uh, re, a retreating waterfall that made uh, this new canyon system. As we overlooked that terrain, uh, in 1983, I first ventured in there, and uh, we looked at it, and we saw some interesting features. For example, there's gully-headed side canyon. Here's the gully-headed side canyon. There's cup-shaped side canyons. And then there's the breach 
the breach should not occur straight through. It has a snaky path, and you see the, uh, the canyon system going down to the west. That's the new north fork of the Toodle River drainage basin, modified radically by mud on March 19, 1982. That uh, event um, made that canyon surface. And, w and we have eyewitnesses and photographic documentation that that happened that way. And uh, it's interesting how the, uh, really interesting how it changed. As we overlook that terrain, in, in 1983, as I first ventured in there, what could come to mind but Grand Canyon? Okay, Grand Canyon. We have a miniature Grand Canyon right there, 140th scale, uh, right through here, coming around the corner. And that canyon is uh, uh, in places over 100 meters deep. That canyon is, uh, is very interesting. And so we, we nickname it the Little Grand Canyon North Fork of the Tudel River. Now I know in uh, Germany we love uh, uh, Grand Canyon. How do I know? Because when I go to Grand Canyon with a large group of people, I always hear somebody speaking German. And uh, G Germans must love Grand Canyon in the United States because you, you see them out there all the time at it. But anyway, look at the canyon system that formed rapidly at the volcano. Rapid canyon formation uh, by, the, by the moving mud. There's the right canyon. All of that was gouged out after the summer of 1980, or after the uh, mud flow of March 19th, 1982. And uh, th th um, that small stream in that canyon, right there, the small stream might appear to have eroded that canyon one sand grain at a time over an immense period of maybe thousands of years. Are you getting at what, how I might imagine that? Small stream, big canyon, long period of time. That's the... Uh, the, the way I normally uh, I might think about these things, and you might think about that because there's uh, and and that's uh, that's the customary way that geologists think is that we look at the modern process and we extrapolate it back, and certainly a, uh, a canyon uh, that deep, um, 50 meters deep, has got to be. Uh, um, immense period of time. But we have the eyewitness uh, photographs and documentation on the ground surface that all that's opened up over the last uh, 40 years. There's a man at the top of that cliff for scale. Right there's a man at that cliff. Do you think that that small stream flowing through that canyon formed that canyon over countless thousands of years? It might appear that way, but we know that's not the explanation. Okay, and as we think about these things, what comes to mind but Grand Canyon, right? And Grand Canyon is a canyon like that, and that's a little Grand Canyon in the North Fork of the Toodle. Here's the big Grand Canyon from a satellite view, and you can see the uplifted an upwarp terrain in the Kaibab upwarp in uh, northern Arizona, and the Colorado River and Grand Canyon are positioned through the upwarp terrain. In other words, it looks like water ponded behind the obstruction uh, to the east, spilled over the deposit, and eroded Grand Canyon. And so Grand Canyon is like the eroded spillover terrain at Mount St. Helens. And though many of us who are talking this way about Grand Canyon are, um, what, excited because we're, we're thinking uh, 
some uh, really interesting thoughts that might explain how Grand Canyon formed. Now, you know the explanation for Grand Canyon's formation. It formed, according to the conventional view, over tens of millions of years by the erosion of the Colorado River as the plateau was slowly uplifted, 3,000 meters above sea level and higher. So the, the uh, 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 Mount St. Helens provides a model to explain the origin of Grand Canyon. How do you like that? Do you like that, that way of thinking? Now there's about, I know, 20 PhDs in geology who are starting to think about spillover erosion of a giant lake on the east side of Grand Canyon, spilling over the, the high terrain and the spillover, eroding a notch and then draining the lake over the uh, western uh, Arizona, uh, and northern Arizona, creating Grand Canyon. And uh, that's getting to be uh, a good explanation in many way, people's way of thinking. Spillover erosion and that old way of thinking about the Colorado River cutting Grand Canyon over tens of millions of years is pretty much refuted among the geologists that I talk to. I can't talk to a geologist that defends the idea of millions of tens of millions of years of erosion of Grand Canyon. The deposits downstream don't seem to match. There's a uh, uh, especially uh, a lack of a, a giant delta down there and the deposits where the um, things first appear look like a giant mud flow and, and big catastrophic erosion event. So Mount St. Helens erosion helps explain the erosion of Grand Canyon. And uh, I'll give a lecture tomorrow on uh, erosion of Grand Canyon and you, uh, we'll talk more about this. But there's the spillway at Mount St. Helens. See the spillway at Mount St. Helens looking straight, straight down through the breach, and here's the spillway at Grand Canyon looking straight down. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the Grand Canyon is 25 to 40 times the scale, but there, there's a lot of similarity there. And so spillway erosion from catastrophic drainage of a mud flow at Mount St. Helens might explain the catastrophic drainage of a lake that breached its dam at Grand Canyon. Good way of thinking? Okay, that, that, that's what Mount St. Helens uh, asks us to think about. Okay, logs uh, and log deposits at Spirit Lake. I was sitting down next to Spirit Lake one day eating my lunch when what should float in but four sticks. Do you see the four sticks? Whoops, sorry, missed. Go back there. Okay, uh, the four sticks. One, two, three, four. And the four sticks are floating there. And uh, they floated in upright position at the edge of the lake and they got grounded. The new lake is now... Uh, what, uh, 70 or 80 meters above the pre-eruption lake level, and this whole lake has been radically modified, and then there's logs and all kinds of things floating on the lake because of the giant water wave at Mount St. Helens, and so the, the, uh, the, the sticks are floating there. So I was, I was eating my lunch, thinking about the sticks floating, see how they, you can see how they float, in the water, some of them float upright, and what did I think about? I thought about the logs that were floating in that lake. A million logs floated in Spirit Lake after the eruption, the, the, uh, the afternoon of May 18, 1980. There was a million logs that were deposited in floating position on the surface of the lake. And those l logs could go I thought, into vertical orientation. Do you see this upright floating log? And they could float there like the sticks at the edge of the lake and they could become grounded 
fall to the bottom and become heavier than water and the whole log could sink to the bottom and then the log could either fall over and be buried and be a prone buried log in the bottom of the lake, I thought to myself, or since the logs fall out at different times with their root ends down, they could be planted in the strata layers at the bottom of the lake at different times and having the appearance of being logs embedded at different levels and being what? Look, looking like forests. That's, uh, that, that's what I saw in, in the way I was thinking at Mount St. Helens. So do you see the way uh, uh, a geologist might think about the floating logs, a million floating logs, they go into upright floating uh, position and then fall to the bottom and get buried. And uh, how could that occur? At the, on the surface of the lake, you can see that's, that's water on the lake surface, but it's covered virtually 100% by uh, logs just floating there. And occasionally you see these upright floating logs in the lake. And you, at the edge of the lake, you can see the upright floaters. Man-made lowering of the lake has slightly tilted those logs, but those logs were fully erect and standing there and were grounded in the shallow water area. And so that's really interesting. And uh, so how would we study these logs? What could we do to study them? We could get a boat into Spirit Lake. So we got a boat in there, and uh, here's the uh, scientists were out there. And we have the sonar recorder in the boat. There's the sonar recorder in the boat. Okay, there's the batteries that power the sonar recorder. And the sonar recorder gives off a paper record of uh, what it sees as you lower the sonar tow fish. Here's the tow fish right here. That's the, that's the object that sends out the sonar signal. And so we uh, studied the profile of the bottom of the lake. It's kind of like a giant fish finder. And uh, there we are. We're looking at the sonar tow fish position. Oh, it looks like about 10 meters, uh, 15 meters above the, the bottom of the lake. There's the first reflection from the bottom of the lake. And then you're looking out, oh, about uh, 50 meters over the bottom of the lake. And as you're looking off to the side off the, uh, of the lake, what do you see? you see upright reflectors what appear to be standing off the bottom of the lake. See the reflectors standing off the bottom and then behind those reflectors, you can see the uh, logs uh, casting a shadow over the bottom of the lake. And some of those shadows, the sonar shadows are 50 meters long and those are huge uh, shadows. And, and look at this, it's a narrow pencil-like reflector off the bottom of the lake. It looks like a, a stump of a tree that's planted there. Here's an inclined reflector, slightly inclined, and there's the inclined shadow behind it. Here's an immense sonar reflector. Look at the immense sonar shadow behind it. That's the trunk of a tree, enormous uh, tree, without flaring root mass, it appears. And so the, the sonar reflections gave us this picture of what the, the bottom of the lake looks like. And it, we were fascinated. How would we study what we saw in the sonar? What, do you have any ideas on what we might do next? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a Naui certified scuba diver, and so I could, drive, I could dive on those upright stumps that the uh, sonar said there would be on the bottom of the lake. And so that's what I did. Uh, there's, whoop, uh, there's my diving, there I am, and there's my diving buddy, and why not have the volcano in the background for added realism? <laughs> Okay, and there we are, uh, enjoying the diving experience in, in Spirit Lake. Uh, 
that's me, and there's my diving buddy, and there's an upright log standing off the bottom of the lake, and there's the steaming lava dome <laughs> in the crater at the volcano. Uh, what better place to be during an eruption than in a large mass of cold water breathing compressed air, you could really enjoy a volcanic eruption. And uh, what better place to, to dive than on these uh, upright, foss, uh, upright logs. Okay, there's a sign at Yellowstone National Park at a place called Specimen Ridge in northeastern Yellowstone National Park. The uh, sign says, uh, across the valleys rise the slopes of Specimen Ridge, but the forest you see there today is only the latest chapter in a remarkable story. Buried within the volcanic rocks that compose the mountain are 27 distinct layers of fossil forest that flourished 50 million years ago. That was the sign at Yellowstone National Park. The um, left side of the sign says Yellowstone's fossil forests are unique. Many stumps still stand upright in the same sites where they grew millions of years ago. Interesting, wasn't it? I went to the ranger, the chief interpretive ranger at Yellowstone National Park, and I said, are you, uh, 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 are you still defending what's on the sign at Specimen Ridge? And the ranger said, I can't find two geologists that agree on the content of this sign. It had become very controversial. And I, and I said to the ranger, are you interested in knowing why it became very controversial? What's happened at Mount St. Helens and the way the logs are being re redeposited like their forests over millions of years has some bearing on the sign. I went back next year to Yellowstone and you know what happened? the sign was gone. They, they removed the sign. It became too controversial. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, the petrified uh, logs in the f slopes of Specimen Ridge are there. And you can see the, the volcanic strata on the, the, the ridge. And poking up through the ridge are these very beautifully agatized stumps of trees. And there you see the modern forest growing there today. What more natural way of thinking than there is the forest or series of forests that grew, 27 forests that grew millions of years ago. That's the, uh, the conventional way of thinking about this. That's, that, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. But... We were able to dig out the roots of some of these petrified logs, and we discovered that the, the roots often terminate about four feet from the, or two meters from the base of the trunk of the tree, and uh, they, uh, they, they abruptly sever, and so it doesn't look like they're planted in soil. It looks like they're planted in uh, volcanic ash debris, and they're at different levels. And then we found a correlating tree ring sequence from logs with the roots buried at different levels indicating that the trees grew at the same time, not at different times, separated by uh, very long periods, periods of time. And so Mount St. Helens provides an a window to help understand petrified logs and petrified forests in the earth. Okay, let's talk now about uh, peat deposits at Mount St. Helens. Very uh, uh, quickly here, I'll go through the uh, um, coal. Coal is that hard, black, compact rock. You can see very beautifully... Uh, 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 glassy bands running through it, see the layered appearance. 
I was thinking about the layered appearance of coal one day and thinking about the conventional theory. You know that coal formed in the conventional way of thinking in large freshwater swamps over thousands of years. The spongy material builds up and that makes peat. Here's a, a peat deposit along shore of Nova Scotia. Coastal erosion has drained the swamp and you can see the, the peat deposit which has built up over hundreds of years and very beautifully preserved peat. And it looks like large objects hanging out. What are those? Roots. Modern swamp peats are intensely root penetrated and create this uh, coffee grounds penetrated by root kind of texture. And it's quite different than the layered coal beds I was studying for my PhD dissertation at Pennsylvania State University. And so I imagined a large floating log mat, floating log mat model for the origin of coal. I was taking a bath one day. It was a day before Christmas, 1978. I remember it vividly, playing with soap suds, imagining a bunch of logs floating on an ocean surface and the large log mat floated around and the logs would rub against one another and the bark would peel, be peeled off and because the bark was water soaked, it could sink to the bottom underneath the floating mat and you could make a peat layer that, in a submerged environment on the bottom of the ocean. And I imagined that at uh, a major university <laughs> Pennsylvania State University in the United States. And uh, I wrote my dissertation on the floating log mat model for the origin of a coal bed. What happened 10 months after I defended my PhD dissertation on the floating mat model for the origin of coal? Mount St. Helens erupted made Spirit Lake into a gigantic bathtub covered with logs. And now you know why I had to go diving in Spirit Lake. Okay, look at the logs floating there. The bark has been rubbed off. Where did the bark go? Oh, it's on the bottom of the lake and there's a thick peat deposit sitting there in the bottom of the lake. So now you can imagine what a catastrophe can make in that uh, lake environment. If we had an ongoing catastrophe, we could bury the sh sheets of tree bark and make what appear to be a coal bed, very similar to coal beds that we have. Life flourishing in the blast zone, okay. Uh, all kinds of plants growing on that new surface, seedling conifers, all the forest fire plants are returning, and elk are coming back into the blast zone. In fact, there are more elk in the blast zone of Mount St. Helens than there were before the, uh, the eruption in 1980. The, uh, the elk realize uh, the decimated environment. They find all of the grassy vegetation they, they can eat. Uh, we thought they'd have a hard time surviving, they, uh, but they are do very well in the 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 summer heat, they lay down and take a siesta in wet soil, and they're doing wonderful. Okay, imagine Mount St. Helens uh, eruption there in 1980, and let's uh, draw a conclusion. The humanist, the, the person who believes he is a master of his own destiny, control of everything around him, there is power not under man's control. Who is in control at the volcano? Man isn't God. Do you know where the scripture verse that says that is? Psalm 104, verse 32. He touches the mountains and they smoke. God reached down a little finger and touches Mount St. Helens. Uh, you know, 57 people died at Mount St. Helens. Nobody needed to die. Uh, that old uh, uh, cabin and that man were buried there at the... Uh, South Shore Spirit Lake. He died on the morning of May 18, but there was full warning. No one needed to die. And that reminds me that a warning has gone out. And uh, what God requires is, is uh, very well uh, known among men. 
volcano in full eruption. That day, it released the energy equivalent of 400 million tons of TNT blast energy, and that just a small to average volcano. And that reminds me of uh, who's in control. The Lord Jesus Christ, he died as a substitutionary atonement for sin. He and I, and I recognize power not under man's control. God is in control, and God has given us a warning, and God has made provision for our need around the volcano. So Mount St. Helens is a Rosetta Stone of uh, catastrophist geology. It's a scale model which helps us understand the global flood and how the earth formed. Mount St. Helens is a, a, a geologic wonder that makes a, a new way of thinking uh, and it helps us decipher this catastrophist way of thinking in geology. Thank you very much.